Praise the Lord. Good evening, everybody. Good to have you with us here at Covenant Faith Center. And uh, we, I think we started right on time, but I do have to get my, um, let's see, I got to find out what, what Facebook I'm on. I think I'm on my Facebook page. And if that's the case, nope, I'm on the church's Facebook page. And then I will copy this over to my page. That way anybody that watches my page, uh, there I am. Okay. So I'm going to share and I'm going to copy and then I go over to my page. All of you that have watched on a regular basis, you know the routine. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Just about got it. Post. All right, so now you should be getting me on either my Facebook page or Covenant Faith Center Facebook page, and either is fine. I just uh, have requests from both followers on both pages to do it on that particular page. All right, so as of right now, praise the Lord, we are on Periscope, and we are on Twitter, and I don't know what happens Sunday, but it ain't going to happen again tonight. So excuse me using ain'ts, uh, that's, you understand. <laughs> Praise God. Father, we thank you tonight for this opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, one of the things that you were called to do in our lives is to remind us, bring to our remembrance what the word says, and even showing us things to come, and to reveal the wisdom of God to us. So Holy Spirit, rise up within me and give me utterance. Rise up within the ears and give them ears to hear and hearts to receive. And I declare that I will speak as an oracle of God and that people that hear this message will not be able to resist the intelligence and the wisdom and the inspiration of the Spirit with which I speak this night. Holy Spirit, I declare that even though it's a Bible study and we're teaching tonight, that the gifts of the Spirit, as needed, as you will, will operate and function to minister to every person that has a need out there. I declare signs and wonders and miracles. I declare healings and answered prayers, and whatever else needs to be done tonight. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to have you again. I'll, I'm going to... Whoa. I turned on my monitor, and I had volume. <laughs> All right. So uh, I, I usually start out a little bit slow uh, because I want to give people a chance to get on and, uh, you know, get hooked up. So uh, I want to go ahead and read the 91st Psalm Confession again tonight, and um, anybody who um, hasn't got this, you can get it, you can do it yourself. We have copies. Um, if you uh, are supporting this ministry and, and uh, as a monthly partner, and anything that I share with you like this, if you want a copy of it, all you've got to do is request it, and uh, we'll get it out to you. All right, Psalm 91, Amplified Translation. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. On Him I lean and rely, and in Him I confidently trust. Therefore, He will deliver me from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover me with His pinions, and under His wings shall I trust and find refuge. His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and a buckler to me. I shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor the arrow, the evil plots and slanders of the wicked that flies by day, nor of pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor of destruction and sudden death that surprise and lay waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come near me only a spectator shall I be, myself inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High, as I witness the reward of the wicked, because I have made the Lord my refuge, the Most High, my dwelling place. There shall no evil befall me, nor any plague come near or, or calamity come near my dwelling. For he will give his angels charge over me to accompany and defend and preserve me in all my ways of obedience and service. They shall bear me up in their hands, lest I dash my foot against a stone. 
I shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent shall I trample underfoot. Because I set my love upon him, therefore he will deliver me. He will set me on high, because I know and understand his name and have a personal knowledge of his mercy, his love, and his kindness, and I trust and rely on him, knowing he will never forsake me. No, never. I shall call upon him. He will answer me. He will be with me in trouble. He will deliver me from that trouble <laughs> and honor me. With long life will he satisfy me and show me his salvation. That long life, uh, people debate over what that, you know, how long is long life. You know, you, you read that verse that talks about um, three score and ten, four score if you're strong in the Lord, you know. Uh, then other people talk about 120 years. And actually both of those were specific to the individual situation. They were never be to a, meant to be a limiting uh, to us. Whatever we can receive by faith, that's what we're going to receive. And, uh, you know, when you, when you get past getting sick and get healed and getting sick and get healed and getting sick and get healed, and you finally get to a place of walking in divine health, which that ought to be all of our goals, and all, all of our goal concerning healing is not to have to get sick and get healed, but to step over into divine health. Because the word says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has already made me free from the law of sin and death. So when you start looking at the word, you feel you finally realize you don't have to keep getting sick and getting healed and going through that cycle over and over again. So begin to believe God. Begin to believe God for divine health. Begin to believe God for, uh, like in Deuteronomy 28, the verse, first 14 verses, one verse in there says God will give you a surplus of prosperity. Why not believe for that? You don't have to consume it upon your own lust, but you can do a lot of work for the kingdom of God if you have that. Why not begin to believe for that? Why not begin to believe for God's best? Amen? Amen. All right. Now let me give you a brief recap. It's been a few weeks since um, I talked about, um, I've been talking about faith. Let me, let me say it this way. I've been talking about faith every Tuesday night Bible study. But it's been a few weeks because we spent a few weeks uh, talking about, uh, I think it was nine sessions we did, uh, seeing heavenly patterns. And so now we're getting back into a specific study again. Uh, we spent over a year studying just the subject of faith. Then we studied what Jesus said about faith. And we studied nine sessions on what Paul said about faith. Then we studied nine sessions on sealing, seek, seeing heavenly patterns. And we, that scripture, which is a great uh, foundation scripture for that, is where Jesus tells us about prayer. And, he, and one of the things he said is, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if you want to know the will of God, ask yourself, is the thing you're facing, is that allowed in heaven? If it's not allowed in heaven, the Bible says what you bind is bound, what you loose is loosed, and you don't have to allow it in your life. So again, why not begin to use your faith for these things instead of feeling like, you know, you get a symptom, you got to run to a doctor, you have a, a problem, you got to go borrow money. Uh, why not do it God's way? Let's begin to move over into operating in heavenly principles thy will be done on earth where we live right now as it is in heaven and in heaven only heavenly principles function amen all right so we spent a total of 17 months studying faith and some of you have been right along with us this whole time and you've been following and you've been uh, listening and uh, yet we've not and you probably realize this we've not exhausted the subject and so we're going to continue tonight with what John had to say about faith. Now here's the thing, as a pastor, one of the things that frustrates, I think, any pastor is to put all the time and effort you put into ministering to people to have them not get it. Uh, and that's very frustrating because you want people to get what God has for them and, and literally all that God has for them. And a lot of times the reason why people don't get it is because they don't really get into it. Um, I can't tell you how many people uh, tune in to our online studies and our online services for a few minutes, and then they go on to something else. Uh, you'll never get the full benefit of the word that God gives to you through us, or through any ministry for that matter, 
when you spend five minutes online, and, and uh, in fact, they say the average time of viewership online is six minutes. We, we need to get beyond that, amen? We need to set aside time to sit and receive what God has to say. All right, so John, 1 John 5, 4, from the Amplified Translation. For whatever is born of God, hallelujah, good to have Pastor Jean-Paul with us uh, this evening. It's evening for us. I don't know where what it is for you but over there in India. Uh, for whatever is born of God is victorious over the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. Too much of what Christians are doing is trying to get God to do what he's already given you authority to do. We're trying to get God to bless us. He's trying to get you to receive it. We're trying to get God to heal us. He wants to get you to receive your healing. We're trying to get God to answer prayers, which he's, for the most part, anything the Bible has declared is a done deal. You don't have to pray about that. But when you got things that the Bible doesn't address specifically, and you go to God in prayer, you have to receive that. You can't blame God if you don't receive it. So, the victory that conquers the world. Now, the world is this natural world that we're living in. It's this, for us right now, it's this time and season. Uh, prophetically, we're living in the end times. We're living in times leading up to the rapture of the church and the beginning of the great tribulation period. Uh, if anybody needs to use your faith and conquer the world, uh, what's going on in the world, the world's plans and strategies, the devil's evil plots, uh, the sicknesses, the diseases, the viruses, whatever else may be out there, this is the time. And primarily, too, you got to stop thinking about it. This is your time. God puts you on earth at, at this day and time. And I, I sometimes I have to just stop and, and sit in awe of God and also of the fact that it's like, like the psalmist says, you know, what is man that you are mindful of him? And I sometimes have to think, you know, God, what am I that you are mindful of me and that you chose me? You handpicked me to be here in this earth at this time, at this age. That's To me, that's an amazing thing. But you need to look at yourself in the mirror and say, God chose me too. <laughs> See, God chose you to be here because he knew there was going to be a group of people, a group of believers that were going to take hold of his word and not compromise and not back down and not quit. We have too many quitters in the church today. We have too many quitters uh, that they'll be in a church for a little while, then they'll decide they don't like something and they'll get bored or whatever, and they'll get up and move to another church. That is not even scriptural. We need to get out of that. That's the devil trying to separate you from things God has for you for the long haul. Amen. So we need to use our faith on purpose and use it to conquer what this world is throwing at us. The Bible says we're more than conquerors. <laughs> if Jesus already won the battle, I don't have to win it again. I just got to enjoy the benefits of it. On our way to church tonight for the Bible study, we were listening to a song. It's an old song. And uh, in the song, uh, some of the words were, <clears throat> um, let's see, I, uh, I can't imagine, I think it was something to the effect, I can't imagine the price I need to pay or the price I owe for what God's done for me. Well, first of all, you don't owe anybody anything. It, salvation is a free gift. If it's a free gift, you don't owe. But we serve the Lord out of our free will. We love the Lord because of what he's done for us, and he loved us first. Amen? Another word of that song was, uh, If the Lord gives us a heavy burden, who am I to argue at God's plan for my life? You know, I thought, whoa, Mary, turn that off. <laughs> I've heard that song many times over the years. I never really heard the words. you got to watch what you listen to. And I thought, no, no, I'm not going to listen to that. My, Jesus said, my burden is light. He tells us to carry his plan, his purpose for our lives. And if it's a light burden, we don't have to worry about a heavy burden coming from God. No, suffering through the mud and the blood and the fire and, the, you know. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm not going to put up with that. I'm overcomer, not undergoer. How about you? Amen. I'm, I'm doing better preaching than some of the people out there listening. Come on, say amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, so 
as I studied through John, both in the book of John and in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, I realized that John didn't really speak specifically about faith. In other words, the word faith, you know. Uh, I guess he left that the, to the Apostle Paul. The bulk of what John talked about in relation to faith has to do with our faith, our trust, our confidence in God. And that's a big deal. We, we need to develop that. Amen? Uh, with all this nonsense about coronavirus, which is weaker than the flu that comes around every year, uh, the devil has convinced Christians, oh, I've got to cover my mat mouth, I can't go outside, i got to stay home, um, you know, I might get the virus. And uh, I mean, there is rampant fear yeah, in the population, not just in this country, but around the world. And, and this attack, it's an attack of the devil. Take dominion, take authority over it, use your faith, shut the thing down. Amen? Amen. I'll answer for you. All right. But what John uses the word faith here as a subject, and not just believing in God, trusting in God, and so forth, it's a very powerful statement. I mean, it's a single statement, but look what he says. Whatever is born of God is. That's present tense. That's not past tense. That's not future tense. You, If you're born again, you already are victorious over the world. It's all yours. It's your possession right now. But then he goes on and gives us a little further insight. He says, and this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. Oh, that's the faith. The faith of God is so powerful. You got to remember when the disciples asked Jesus to increase their faith, his response was, Have the faith of God. You know, and, and I'm sure if I was there, probably my first question would be, uh, How do I get that? <laughs> but he immediately illustrates it. And he illustrates it by telling them, you know, and I'll just use one of the examples if you had faith, you would say, you would say what? But then he talked about speaking to trees. He talked about speaking, uh, he, well, we see his example. He spoke to fish. He spoke to trees. He spoke to water. He spoke to bread and fish for eating. Um, I mean, you know, the list probably goes on. He spoke to disease. He spoke to demons. And he wasn't just carrying on conversation with demons. We don't do that. If a demon starts talking to me, I rebuke him and command him to go. I'm not going to sit there and listen to him. I don't care what he's got to say. It will all end in a lie. So I do not talk to demons. So, But I have dominion and authority over them, so I use that to shut them up. I'm not going to listen to their lies. I'm not going to listen to their deception. You have the same authority over symptoms that come in your body and everything else the world is trying to throw at you. But he said our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Well, the victory is Jesus already won the battle. And when we have faith in what Jesus did then all of a sudden we become world overcomers. Hallelujah. Amen? All right. Um, Romans chapter 10. I'm going to link a lot of verses here together tonight. Uh, this is what Paul is saying, but it connects to what John said. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, from the Amplified Translation, it says, invoking him as Lord, will be saved. Verse 14, but how are people to call upon him whom they have not believed in, whom they have, ha have no faith, on whom they have no reliance? Hey, Sister Bibler, good to have you with us tonight. Hallelujah. I haven't heard from you for a long time. I hope we're making you proud here. <laughs> it's our former pastors back when Mary and I first got married. That's a few years ago. Rick Walker, good to have you with us also. And again, Pastor John Paul from India. All right, so uh, verse 14, he goes on and says, And how are they to believe in him? How they are they to, and I'm reading Amplified Translation, how are they to adhere to, trust, and rely on him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? And how can men be expected to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring glad tidings. How welcome is the coming of those who preach the good news of his good things. 
Well, I'm declaring right now, I have blessed feet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. When I grew up in church, my grandmother was a preacher, my mother was a worship leader. Any of you that have been around us for a long time, you already know that. But there was a lot, there have been a lot of people in my lifetime that have jumped out because they get they get born again, they get excited. And they jump out and, and they're going to start a ministry with no training, no, no, um, uh, I, Pastor Mary and I were just talking, uh, I think it was last night, how great it would have been if we could have been associate pastors for a time as we started the ministry and got some really good training. And I, I praise God for the pastors that I had, uh, uh, Pastor Bibbler, Sister Bibbler, what a blessing they have been and still are to our lives. And, and we got training in a roundabout way. And finally, I was able to do some correspondence courses and, and, and you know, so on and so forth. Uh, got a lot of on the job training. But I have seen person after person over the last 47 years of ministry uh, that jump in with both feet. They're all excited, they're gung ho. And sometimes they, they build a great work, they build a great ministry, a great church. And after a few years, they're gone. And I think, what in the world? What happened to them? Well, sometimes I have to go back and look at these verses and think, how many of them actually did not get called to ministry? They, are, they were stepping out on excitement, on um, emotion, and God never really called them into full-time ministry. Now, we're all, as believers, we're all called to minister. We're all called to preach the gospel to every creature. We're all called to lay hands on the sick and, and so forth. But not everybody's called into an office of full-time ministry. And I think the reason why so many men and women have been discouraged and quit over the years is because they never really had a calling. And you know the interesting thing, and this is what the Lord by the Holy Spirit reminds me often, the callings of God are without repentance. I'm a pastor till the day the Lord returns. I'm a teacher of the word until the day the Lord returns. That will never change because God does not change his mind. And so when I look at a verse like this, how can they preach unless they're called? I know I was called. I remember the day that God spoke to me in an audible voice. And I did not know anybody personally up to that point in my life that ever heard the audible voice of God. So that was a new thing to me. But I remember when when God called me into the ministry and I was standing in an Assembly of God church in a fellowship hall watching activities go on and I heard the voice of God. In fact, I jumped a little bit and turned to see who was standing next to me. There was nobody around me and I'm hearing an audible voice. Uh, God speaking to me and calling me into the ministry. I had no idea because my understanding of ministry was to be a pastor and I didn't see very many happy pastors. Uh, to be a missionary and I sure didn't want to do that. <laughs> Uh, and to be an evangelist. And I couldn't see me out on the streets preaching on the street corners. Even though I've had some experience with that, I knew that wasn't my calling. So I didn't, I didn't know. And when God spoke to me, and the first thing he told me I was called to do was to teach the Word. And I thought, what, I'm a Sunday school teacher? I mean, you know, I, I don't understand that. It took me some learning and growing to understand what an anointed teacher was. And it's, and it's a lot different than just coming in and teaching a Sunday school class. Um, then when God called me to pastor, second time I heard the audible voice of God. I was driving my little 1960 Volkswagen uh, over Sepulveda Pass. We came out to do a Bible study, which was the beginning of this church, that we didn't know that. And God spoke to me, and again I jumped. I thought somebody was in the back seat of my car. And I heard this audible voice, and then I recognized it. That was the same voice that God called me into the ministry with. And, and I, I, uh, what he told me was that that Bible study that I just conducted was not just a home Bible study. It would be, it is a church, and it was a new church, and I was the pastor of it. Well, that was my calling, but I didn't do anything because I was submitted to a pastor at that time. And I said, Lord, you got to speak to my pastor. You need to speak to my wife first. <laughs> and then there were four of us that were rotating in this Bible study coming out to the valley from, we lived in Hawthorne. And every month, each of us would preach one time. And I turned out to be the first one after the other three had to back out for some reason or another. And I said, you gotta speak to those other three men. So the need, God needed to speak to the other three men, to my pastor, and to my wife before I was gonna jump out and do anything. 
And you know what? The, God spoke to my wife. God spoke to the other three men. God spoke to my pastor. My pastor came to me one day. Was, I was in the office helping out around the church. And, and uh, he said, Brother Bill, he says, just very blunt, has God called you to be a pastor? I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> he said, out there in the valley? I said, yes. And he said, what are you going to do about it? Just like that. I said, well, I'm going to be a pastor. <laughs> and it wasn't, literally, it was not very long until we were in full-time ministry. But I say all that to come back to this point that how can somebody go and preach unless they're called to do it? It's not just something we want to do. I've talked to his pastors that I, I've asked them, well, how did you get in the ministry? How did this come about? And they've said, well, I, I just always loved the ministry of watching preachers, and I just really like that. And I said, one day I'm going to be a preacher. And I, I heard one pastor, a guy who was pastoring a church, and I said, you know, ask him the same question. And he said, well, my aunt uh, offered to uh, pay for a rent on a building so we could come out here and start a church. And I thought, well, you know, that, I don't know if that's going to work well. That didn't work very long. Uh, others have had people say, well, somebody prophesied over me. I got news for you. If somebody prophesies full-time ministry over you, you better put that on the shelf before you do anything. I'm telling you, you'll get yourself in hot water. You'll go out and do the wrong thing, fall flat on your face. We don't do something because somebody prophesies. Prophecy is a confirmation of what God has already spoke to us. When, when my pastor came to me and asked me, and he didn't prophesy. He just asked. He God spoke to him. See, are you called to pastor? He knew where, and, and you know, and uh, I said yes. That was simply a confirmation what God spoke to me. In my case, an audible voice. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to have an audible voice uh, to you know something supernatural like that. But for me, that's what it took. God knows how to get your attention. Amen. All right. So, so that brings us then to. Uh, back to faith and Romans 10 17 connects here with what John said uh, when John said this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith and it's in that verse and that use where he used it that one time it was the the power uh, the force of faith it was not just a belief in God it was not just even trusting God because you can do that and never be in the ministry but it was uh, the force of faith, which when applied in and through our lives, brings forth miracles, brings forth healings and deliverance and sets captives free. It gets results. Amen? So we go back to Romans now 10, 17. So then, faith cometh. What does faith do? This is an action word here. Cometh. Uh, when you do what the following the rest of that verse says, faith is going to come. Faith in your life is going to increase. Faith cometh. How? By hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, if you look up that on the end of that verse, the Word of God, the Greek word there it is the one that it literally means to speak, to talk. Uh, it's the rhema, the Greek word. And it means to speak, to talk, to declare, to utter, to mutter. In fact, in the Strong's Concordance, if you look the word up, and this also is the same in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew word for that. Uh, it gives, Strong's gives a lot of one word definitions to what that word means. And when I checked it out years ago, and I, I go back and restudy it many times since then, uh, all these one word definitions, it was three fourths, or 75% of them had to do with some kind of physical utterance, and only 25% had to do with thinking. That tells me that the emphasis is on what we say, not just what we think. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear. If you believe in your heart that the things you say will come to pass, you shall have whatsoever you say. It doesn't have, say, you shall have, have soever what you, well, excuse me, I'm getting tongue tied here. It does not say, you shall have, or, <laughs> have whatsoever, I'm combining words, I'm making up new words as I go. It does not say, you shall have whatsoever you thinketh. It, ha it says, you shall have whatsoever you saith. Now, there's a whole lot more behind that. I'm not going to get into all that tonight. But we've got to understand that when we begin to take God at his word and we begin to declare what God has declared, 
we're speaking the same thing. That's how we grow our faith. That's how the disciples were being told to increase their faith. If you had faith, you would say. We would say what? Say to this mountain. Say to this tree. Say to that cancer. You know, I've been saying now for a number of years, my youth is renewed daily. Uh, this year I turned 71. I know, Sister Bibler, if you're still watching, you can't probably believe I'm 71 years old. But, uh, you know, time goes, goes on. Amen? Uh, anyway, uh, I, do not, I do not feel like 71 years old. I don't know what you're supposed to feel like at 71. Because when I was a teenager, everybody I knew from 50 years on up to me were old and, and, and just having challenges physically, you know. Uh, we don't have those. Why? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. Because we walk in divine health instead of going through the cycle of getting sick and then praying for healing all the time. There's a difference in a person's life who literally walks by faith and does what the Bible says which is not only meditate it, that's the first step. You've got to meditate the Word of God. James says to do it. In the Old Testament, it says Joshua 1 8, which is our foundation scripture. This is what's kept us going for all these years. In Joshua 1 8, thou shalt, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You notice it didn't say, it shall not depart from your thinking. If you're saying it, you're thinking about it. Because you can't talk except for speaking in tongues. You can't talk about one thing and be thinking about something else. You'll get totally messed up. And you'll end up saying the wrong stuff. When you're praying in tongues, that's different. Your mind's unfruitful. You can, you can talk and still be praying in tongues. You can read and still be praying in tongues under your breath, quietly. All right. So the first step is, he says, meditate my word day and night that you might observe and do. The word observe means, means to gain insight to the New Testament. That's epinosis, the Greek word. That's revelation knowledge. What Peter got when Jesus asked him, Who do you say that I am? He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Peter, you are blessed. You are right on. You are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. But my Father, which is in heaven, hath revealed it to you. And he said, And upon that rock I'm going to build my church. He didn't say he's going to build his church on Peter. Different Greek word was used there. He said, I'm going to build my church upon revelation knowledge. As people get a hold of the word on salvation, they hear the message, and it goes off inside them, and it becomes a, a revelation to them. They get born again. God's building his church. When you hear the word on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and speaking in tongues, at some point it goes off inside of you. You know that's truth, and you get a personal revelation on it, and you begin to receive that. That's building God building his church. Uh, when you get the word on healing, and it goes off inside of you. And all of a sudden you come to a point you know healing is mine. It belongs to me. And, and I can receive it anytime I need it. That's Jesus building the church. Everything we receive by faith, when we get the revelation of it, is a step of growth for us. Forgiveness is a step of growth. Loving your enemies is a step of growth. Um, and I can just go on and on with all kinds of examples. The point is, that when we talk about faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word, that specifically is talking about what we're saying. So we go back to Joshua 1a, which I didn't finish. You shall meditate upon it day and night that you might observe or gain insight. And then he said, do what's written therein. James says the same thing. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. I'm going to get into that in a few minutes, I think. All right. He said, now, now listen to this. This is... Uh, every time I've read this for years, I mean, since 1973, this has been my, my scripture here. And it goes on and says that for then, when you've done that, you've meditated, got the revelation, and acted on the word, then you shall make your way prosperous, then you shall deal wisely, and then you shall have good success. You can't get any better than that. Prospering. Spirit, soul, and body. We're not just talking about having a lot of money. We're talking about spiritual prosperity, soulish prosperity, and natural or physical prosperity. He said, you're going to prosper. You're going to deal wisely. How many Christians have made wrong decisions, unwise decisions, and messed up their lives, messed up their families, their careers, whatever it may have been? When you do what the Word says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it helps you to deal wisely in the affairs of life and having good success. Well, 
I don't want any bad success. Now there is, I've got, I'm working on a book, it's one of the numbers I'm working on, uh, talking about good success. That's the title of it, good success. Because there is such a thing as bad success, and that's the world's idea of success. Notoriety, money, fame, power, those all are the world's idea of success. If you got a lot of money, you live in a big house, drive a beautiful new expensive car, wear fancy clothes, uh, or you've got a job where there's power and success in that, or you're maybe in politics and you've got success there. These are the ideas. You know, they, right now the world promotes the entertainment industry as the ideal of success. That's the worst place you can be if, you, if God's not in what you're doing. And there's a lot of people out there that were Christians who lost their faith by living that world's lifestyle in the entertainment industry. So we have to understand there's bad success, which is the world's idea, and then there's godly success. I, I would rather have godly success, no matter how much the world wants to offer me. Amen? Amen. Thank you for all those loud amens. I can almost hear you. <laughs> all right, so... <clears throat> When we look at that verse, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh. Faith, dunamis, that power, that's the glory of God, actually. But the glory of God is connected to faith. When you operate in faith, you're going to experience the glory of God. But when faith comes, as you're speaking and declaring God's word over your life, that's why we, we take Psalm 91 and we turn it into a confession of faith. We just put it first, first person and make it personal, and we declare Psalm 91 over our lives. That's why we're not afraid of coronavirus or anything else the devil wants to throw at us. Hallelujah. Because we believe what that says, and when we declare it over our lives, we release the power of God into our situation to bring these things to pass. I'm not worried about dying of the coronavirus. I'm not even, I, I'll tell you what, it ain't coming near me. That's what that says. It's not coming near me. Amen. All right, so faith that conquers the world incorporates our faith or our belief in God, our trust in God, and our direct response. That's our actions. Our direct response to the belief and the trust we have in God. You can't say, I'm a believer, and not have some corresponding actions. If you're a believer, you ought to be acting like you're a believer. If you say, well, I'm a Christian, you're out drinking and smoking and partying and all the stuff the world's doing, then I question whether or not you're truly born again. Now, I, I understand there are people that are born again that are out living the world's lifestyle, but that is death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. I want none of that. And I don't think you want it either, but you got to decide my lifestyle is going to change. I'm going to begin to put my trust and my faith in God into action in my life. Amen. All right. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. I'm going to read it again. We started with this. For whatever is born of God is, present tense, victorious over the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and connect this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is. We've got to remember faith is always present tense. Saying what you used to believe doesn't do a bit of good. Saying what you hope to experience really isn't an answer. It's what does the word say now? Faith is now. See, you know, I, people say, and I've heard this all my life, well, I hope to be healed someday. Well, someday is in the future. That means every time you say that, you're putting off your healing to the future. What the word of God says is by his stripes ye were healed, that is past tense. It's already a done deal. If I were, then I are. <laughs> you understand that? I am healed. If it was done 2,000 years ago, then it's already mine. I don't have to get it. I just receive it. Amen? Thank you for that. All right. So, now I like the way it's, it's put in the King James here. Now, present tense, faith is present tense. You can't get around it. It's, it's <laughs> both sides. It's, it's present tense. Amen? Faith is the assurance, amplified translation, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for. Now, let me stop there. The word hope 
means confident, favorable expectation of good things to come. God wants you to have confidence and have a, a favorable, a good expectation of good things to come into your life. Well, what if God's trying to teach me something? Well, where in the Bible does it say God uses trials, tests, and tribulations? He, he, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's not God. But Jesus said, but I came to give you life and that in abundance. There is our dividing line right there. If it's stealing, killing, and destroying, I know it's not God. Therefore, I will not receive it. If it's life in abundance, I know it is God's plan, and that I'll receive. Amen? Amen. All right. So, he says, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not yet see. See, faith, I don't need faith to, to come in and sit in this chair, unless there's something wrong with the chair. I've been sitting in these chairs for years now. I don't need any faith for that. I just come in, I sit down. That's a knowing, right? I know these chairs will hold my weight. I know I can sit in them. There's, there's no problem with that. I don't need to exercise one ounce of faith for that. Now, if the chairs were falling apart, I might have to use my faith. But that's not the case, amen? So there's a difference. Here he says, faith is the proof of things we don't yet see. Well, if you're believing God for your healing, or you believe in God for financial provision, or whatever it may be, when you develop your faith, that's the Word of God for that situation, and you meditate upon that, and begin to declare that over your body. By His stripes, I was healed, therefore I am healed. He bore my infirmities, my sicknesses, my diseases, my pains, my sorrow, my punishment, and he bore them as my substitute. And since he bore them, I, my will is I will not bear them. And I have it and I won't in the name of Jesus. But it also says another thing. It says he became poor that through his poverty you might have abundance. Now for people who want to spiritualize that and say, well, that was spiritual poverty versus spiritual prosperity. The death that man died was spirit, soul, and body. The redemption Jesus paid for was also spirit, soul, and body. So I have a right to believe God and to receive for spiritual prosperity, physical prosperity, soulish prosperity. That's my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions. Hallelujah. All right. So he says, faith is assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things we hope for, the proof or the evidence of things we do not see with our eyes. Doesn't the Bible say we walk by faith and not by what? Sight. Well, sight is a physical sense. How about we walk by faith and not by hearing? Unless we're hearing the word. We walk by faith and not by feeling. We walk by faith and not by, and then we, we include all the physical senses in there. It comes down to we walk by faith over no matter what the senses tell us. Hello? Amen. All right. The conviction of the reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. Your body may be telling you're sick, but God's Word says you're healed. I choose the Word over the, over the symptom in my body. Hallelujah. You've got to choose the Word. You've got to choose the Word over sin. You've got to choose the Word over sickness and disease. You've got to choose the Word over poverty and lack. You've got to choose the Word over unforgiveness, over anger and hate, racism. You've got to choose the Word. We have to choose the word over area, every area of our lives. So every time we're confronted with something that's contradictory to the word, we have to make a choice. And our life is the result of the choices we've been making and the things we've been saying. Because what we say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? And one translation of the, those verses says, out of the good deposit in your heart, the man will bring forth good things. Out of the evil deposit in your heart, you will bring forth evil things. Well, how do I know what's on deposit? What are you meditating upon? If I'm meditating upon the Word of God, then I'm going to have a good deposit. If I'm meditating upon the things the world is telling me, I'm going to have evil deposit because they're not telling me the truth. And what's going to come out? 
He says, words out of the abundance of the heart, whatever is on deposit in your heart is what comes out of your mouth under pressure. You want to know how what, what's in you in abundance? Stub your toe in the middle of the night. <laughs> you swing a hammer and accidentally hit your finger. <laughs> when I, I remember when I worked in the steel mills, uh, this is way back. Um, I, I was a, a fitter, which is like a carpenter, except I worked built, I built bridges with steel, you know. And I had a sledgehammer, and I, I was putting a stiffener goes across. The, it's, it's, well, I, I won't get into it anyway. I, I had a stiffener. We would tack weld it, then hit it with this hammer, and I would seal it up against the web of the of the girder that we were building. And uh, you have to hit it pretty hard, and that weld, while it's still hot, will squish down. Then it's like, if I can say it this way, it kind of glues it in place. And then you come back along and weld the whole thing. One day I missed. I had this four pound sledgehammer. I caught my finger right here, right, right there. And I peeled the flesh back. I mean, it was all the way down, pouring blood out. Instead of doing what a lot of people do, even Christians, I've heard them do it, cuss. You know, my first words were, in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. Just about like that. In fact, some of the guys working around kind of turned and looked at me like, is he getting religious on us now? <laughs> you know, but, and I didn't even see it at that point. I just felt it. I pulled my glove off, and here's a piece of flesh just, you know, kind of flopped out that way. And you can see the raw, I know it sounds ugly. You can see the raw flesh in there and blood coming out. And so I said, no, I don't receive that. I'm healed. And I, I just kind of wrapped it up like that. And I went over to the infirmary, and, and uh, they put some, uh, I think they put some disinfectant on it, and they put a Band-Aid around it, and I went back to work. Well, here I am all these years later. There's not even a scar. There is no evidence at all that anything ever happened. I know what happened. <laughs> well, what came out of my mouth under pressure? Did I curse? No. And I'm not bragging. I'm telling you that because I fed, I was feeding on the Word of God day and night, that what came out was what the Word says, in the name of Jesus. Well, the Bible says, at the use of that name, every knee must bow. Injury, you got to bow to the name of Jesus. And in that name is my healing. In that name is my deliverance. In that name is my provision. Because every knee has to bow to the use of that name. Amen? All right, so let's move on. So now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All right, James chapter 2. Verse 17, King James Translation. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now, another translation says that faith without corresponding actions, and that's a real good picture of what he's talking about. Faith without actions that correspond to what you say you believe is ineffective. It's dead. He says it's alone. Why? Because you got to mix action with faith. The Bible talks about the uh, uh, Hebrew children when they were going into the promised land. And remember they sent 12 spies. And when they came back, the, tw the 10 of the 12 spies gave their evil report, it says in Hebrews. And it was, they started off, you know, well, yeah, the, the land is everything God said it was. They should have shut up right there. But they didn't. Then they went on and said, but there's giants in the land and there's high walled cities and the land swallows up its inhabitants. Well, there were giants and there were high walled cities, but the land doesn't swallow its inhabitants. They began to exaggerate. They, they let the spirit of fear get on them, and instead of saying what God said and being done with it, they began to say what they felt. And we were as grasshoppers in our sight, see, in our sight, and so we were in theirs. The way you think about yourself determines how other people are going to think about you. So the Bible says they gave an evil report. And then the two, Joshua and Caleb, come along and they give their report. And they said everything is like God said it was. Here's the fruit. It's abundant. Let's go up at once and take it for we are well able. What are they doing? They're saying what God told them. He told them, take the land. You can do it. They, those two said, we can take the land. Let's go. The... the, the nation, the th over three million Jews began to cry. They began to moan and groan and, in fear and drowned them out. They began to say 
It would have been better to die in Egypt. It would be better for us to die out here in this wilderness than to try and take that land. You know what God said? It's amazing. You, you, have to, you, have, you have to go back and read this. Not many preachers will tell you this. Go back and read. God says, as you have spoken in my hearing, that will I have to allow to come on you. And the word allow, it's a causative permissive verb in the Hebrew language. Where, it's, where it says, I will do that as you've spoken in my hearing, I will have to do unto you. That's not what it said. It was a causative permissive verb. And it says, I will have to allow it. They declared the results they wanted. They didn't want it necessarily, but that's what they declared. And the Bible says in Hebrews, they couldn't enter into the promised land because they did not mix faith with God's word. Joshua and Caleb didn't. Guess who got to go into the promised land? Joshua and Caleb. They mixed faith with what God said, and that was actions. They had to take action on what they believed in God's that he said. When you believe you're healed, you get up and act like you're healed. When you believe God's going to meet your needs, you get, you get up and act like God's meeting your needs. When you believe that God answers your prayer, you get up and act like it's done. Now, I'm not just saying actions alone because it says faith without works. That it's, it's alone. But when you put faith and works together, you start getting results. Hallelujah. All right. So, verse 18 of James chapter 2, and I've got just a few minutes left. Yea, yes, a man may say, Thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, that's not a bragging thing. That's a statement of accuracy that I have to have works that correspond to what I say I believe. Hallelujah. Verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So when you say, well, I believe in God, you're, you're no better than the devil, than demons. They believe in God. They know he exists. It's when you say, I believe what God said, and based on what God said, I'm taking action. That scares the devil. Hallelujah. All right. Verse 20. Well, wilt thou, O vain man, wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works or corresponding actions is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his, or working with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? You need to meditate upon that until it hits you, until you get that revelation. I like that. An amplified, oh, that's King James, actually. See how faith wrought or worked with, with his works. Faith and works go, work together. And by works was faith made perfect. When you act on the word, you allow faith to manifest the answer, the solution. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, uh, I got about six minutes left. Let me finish these verses here. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith or belief alone. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she's had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body, now, now listen, he, he's giving you illustrations here. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works or corresponding actions is dead also. Or empty, you could say. If you go to, Re, uh, Re, <laughs> if you go to Romans, I'm going to have to probably wrap it up with this. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say, then, that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof the glory. In other words, if it was just good works, then he could brag on himself, say, look what I did. Of course, that doesn't stand before God. But, that's what it says, but not before God. For what hath, what saith the scripture? 
Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, the believing was made perfect by his corresponding actions. Amen? All right. So Abraham's faith moved him to take, listen, seemingly unreasonable actions. But it was because he believed God. And he understood covenant. He was a covenant man. And he trusted God. Now, Hebrews, oh, we're getting close here on time. Hebrews 11, verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting, now listen, accounting that God was able to raise him up from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now I want to stop there because uh, if I get into the next group of scriptures I want to read related to that, that would uh, take us another hour probably. <laughs> And I'm not going to do that. So we'll continue this next week. I hope you're getting something out of this. Um, that, that statement there. Abraham took extreme action. He believed that if he ended up having to sacrifice his son and burn him on the altar, that God would raise him from the dead, one place that says, from the ashes. That's extreme faith. But God was creating a condition where man then could call upon God for his son. And I'll get into that more next week. I want to say how much I appreciate all of you that have tuned in tonight and watched this program. I trust we're a blessing to you. I don't want to leave you hanging, so you got to come, come back next week and get the rest of this teaching. But we appreciate you. And all of our partners out there, you, you folks that have decided to partner with us on a monthly basis, that, that has been such a blessing. It's helped us to be able to do what we do for the kingdom of God and to be able to be here to bless you. If you're not a partner with us and uh, we are a blessing to you, we ask you to pray about it. Just, you know, say, Lord, uh, number one, do you want me to partner with uh, Pastor Bill Emmons? Number two, what do you want me to do about it? We're looking, we're believing God for partners that will partner with us on a monthly basis so we can continue to increase our impact on this world. And, if, and if our partners, it's like you're taking arm in arm with us and we're marching through the world and we're conquering as Jesus said we would, and that's the Bible said we would, but we're doing it together. And the Bible says because you share in what we do as our partners, you get the benefit and the credit for everything we accomplish. That's a great thing. And then the seed you sow, the Bible says, will produce a harvest. So every time you give into this ministry, and I believe it's good soil, that that seed, that financial seed you sow, is going to come back to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You support the work of God, God gets involved supporting you. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, I'm not asking you to tithe to this ministry. If you have a home church, you ought to be tithing there. Now, I will say this. If you don't have a church, and I've got at least one partner here that lives in an area where she can't give to a church, uh, at least one that preaches the word, uh, so she ties to our ministry. Uh, and, and I accept that, and we believe for the blessings to the tither. But if you don't have a home church and, and you're getting ministered to by us, then I offer the suggestion, maybe you want to pray about tithing into this ministry. Irregardless, we're believing God for partners. Pray about it. If God speaks to you about that, let me tell you how you can get involved. We have a PayPal account. The email address, you can use for PayPal, which is a free app, by the way. You can get it on your phone or iPad or even on your computer. Uh, it's our, our email for that is wemmons one at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to mail uh, your, your partner giving in, uh, post office box 4238. That's West Hills, California, 91308. If you want to give by debit or credit card, you can text that to 818-679-7067. We'll run your giving, uh, your credit card giving, and then we'll delete that so it's not there any longer. Uh, or you can email it to us at that same email we use for PayPal, and that's wemmons one at gmail.com. We also recently set up a Venmo account. 
And you can look for my name, William Emmons, Pastor William Emmons, and uh, you should see a picture of me on there, hopefully. Uh, and you can give through there, and they won't deduct any fees for your giving. So there's a lot of ways you can give. Just be obedient to what the Spirit of God tells you to do. And, a, and as we see that, and we see you become a partner with us, we're going to be praying for you day. Well, I, I started to say day and night. That's not true. Uh, but we will pray for you. I pray for all my partners at least twice a day. Uh, and uh, first thing in the morning and last thing at night. And I won't get into what I pray for you now, but we pray blessings. So we love you guys. Appreciate you. Sunday morning, we'll be live streaming online with our service uh, here at Covenant Faith Center in Chatsworth. So join us at 10 o'clock, and then we'll be back next Tuesday night. With that, we say good night and be blessed in the name of Jesus.